sports flowing in their veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and scorenorth.com. I mean, they got us in transition in different ways, turnovers. We missed a bunch of bunny layups that they converted um, at, at very uh, opportune times for them. Um, you know, they, 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 made a, they made a concerted effort to push at us. Um, you know, I just I thought for the most part, uh, you know, the game was lost for us in the first half. I thought we were really flat, you know, we, uh, in the first half. So, you know, that kind of just fell into an effort category where we just didn't really want to put the work in to get back. That was a that was sad Chris Finch after the Wolves got beat at the buzzer the other night in New Orleans. Phil Mackey, Judd Zolgad, our executive producer, Declan Goff, and our friend from the Five Eyewitness News Sports Department and the Scoop Podcast, Darren Doogie Wolfson. Happy Reckless Speculation Thursday. Reckless speculation. It is gentlemen. here. Good morning, gentlemen. Happy Reckless Speculation Thursday. Yes, and we've got all kinds of Vikings GM fodder and updates, and like we're, we're going to be all over that today, like we are every day. But you know, we've you know, the, some people in the audience the last week or two have been saying, "Where's all the wolf stuff? We, you guys aren't talking about the wolves lately." So we figured let's devote a chunk of time here to juicy Timberwolves trade fodder. You want reckless speculation? You know this ain't gonna happen. How about yeah. reckless trade speculation? Yes. Doogie, empty the bag. I know you had Windhorst on your podcast, and uh, that conversation's making the rounds, but Ben Simmons, John Collins, what are the Wolves up to behind the scenes when it comes to trade fodder? Well, certainly, Phil, Sachin Gupta is trying to upgrade the roster ahead of the February 10th trade deadline. He has planted many seeds. They can use shooting help. They can still use some interior help. Where Jared Vanderbilt, like that energy, that enthusiasm, that skill set, that can translate off the bench. And, oh, by the way, depending on situation, he can play crunch time minutes. But you could make a move for, say, a four-man transition jared to the bench i know the starting five it's a plus the numbers 50 are per 100 the roof. <laughs> line up it death. is now i guess the comeback to that is is that still a relatively small sample size but yes there's no denying how successful delo bev ant fandy cat have been when those five are on the court it's as good a five some as there has been in the league at the halfway point we're at about the halfway point of the season. But yeah, Ben Simmons still on the Wolves radar. Miles Turner, I'll give you a new name. Harrison Barnes, where Sachin Gupta has a good relationship with Monty McNair, who runs the Sacramento Kings. Remember, Sachin finished runner up to McNair for that job in Sacramento. They've connected along the way, you know, going back to their Houston days. So that's another name. The Wolves have had their assistant general managers, John Luca, Branch. Zarco in their personnel department. Those guys have been out and about watching NBA games. They've been doing a lot of college scouting because as of now, they have four draft picks in June, three second round picks, their own first round pick. But they certainly have done a lot of trade scouting. I'll credit a Sacramento reporter who noted on Monday, one of the Wolves higher ups was at the Kings Cavs game. The Wolves are not playing the Kings in the next week or two. They're not playing the Cavs in the next week or two. That was not for scouting, hey, we're scouting our future opponent, you know, sake. That was for trade sake. Mm. So, yeah, so he's working it pretty good. He wants to improve the roster that they see an obvious pathway to the play-in tournament, but could they even ascend above that? Could they get as high as the sixth seed, avoid the play-in tournament altogether? Remember, the goal is to make the playoffs. If you get eliminated in the play-in tournament, you're thus then in the lottery, right? You're not a playoff team. If you're one and done or two and done, you know, and you're summarily dismissed after the play-in tournament, you're not a playoff team. The Wolves' stated goal going back to the Kumbaya trip in Miami in early September, the one that cost them six figures, it was all about we are a playoff team. So Sachin Gupta wants to aid in that goal. So he's trying, I can promise you that. Give me, um, give me the, a name that you recklessly think is probably the most likely to land here. Well, I mean, I just think it's really hard to trade for Ben Simmons. I've been saying that since June. I even think Miles Turner is a really hard trade to execute. 
They have not reached out on Jeremy Grant of Detroit, to my knowledge, at least as of earlier this week. I can't say that I'm checking on a daily basis, but I did check on his name earlier in the week. He is just now like on the verge of coming back from uh, like a four or five week type injury, but he'll be okay here before the deadline. Maybe it's still another couple weeks until he returns to game action. But Jeremy Grant is a really good player. The Wolves have Torian Prince's expiring contract at, you know, 13, 14 million. They have Jake Lehman's expiring contract. I do think putting the 2022 first round pick on the table is something that Gupta is open minded to because as of right now, that pick looks like it'll be like pick 13, 14, 15, 16. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be pick four, pick five. Yeah. And while I really love the top of, of this summer's draft, it gets muddled there in the middle. Kind of like the last couple of years, or at least one of the last couple of years, where the guy you get at 14 may not be all that different from the guy you get at pick 36, 37. And so this might be the time. I know Wolves fans don't like to hear giving up a first round pick, but I can make a case that for the right guy, you give up your first round pick in June. But yeah, I mean, Harrison Barnes <laughs> certainly is a name to keep an eye on. Jeremy Grant. As well, I know John Collins's name has sort of been floated out there. We know from you know previous trade deadlines and you know summertime acquisitions that the Wolves, you know, like him. That there are fans over at Mayo Clinic Square of of John Collins. He signed the new contract, but Atlanta has been a dumpster fire. So I would certainly keep an eye on Atlanta. I'm not quite sure the Wolves and Hawks are a good match until I hear that the Hawks have interest in Malik Beasley. Like right now. Yeah, I just I don't know if I see any sort of match and you'd have to go Beasley plus a lot more. I'm just saying maybe you would start with Beasley, go from there. But Atlanta is definitely a team to keep an eye on. Indiana is certainly a team to keep an eye on. Portland as well. You know, Wendy threw out Nurkic expiring contract. Covington, Robert Covington, former Wolf expiring contract that Portland is above the luxury tax right now. They need to do something. So they are going to do something. So what about the idea, Damian Lillard, it looks like he'll be out for a little bit of time. It might be time for Portland to say, you know what, we just don't have it this year. Let's start making some moves. So I would certainly keep an eye on Portland as well. Robert Covington still has fans here in the Twin Cities. So I suppose that would be another name to keep an eye on. There's so many sort of moving parts here too in that, like Ben Simmons, for instance, it kind of feels like, the only way to acquire Ben Simmons is to give up one year big three, right? And I know that Wendy told you that you guys are both sort of hearing that the Wolves have thrown every type of offer, not including Cat or Ant. And we know that at some point they had some discussions around D'Lo, but D'Lo's been such a great cog for this team on offense, defense. He's He's been a leader. He's been um, great. But, Phil, let me stop you there. I've yet to hear that Philadelphia wants D'Lo. As brilliant as he has been for the Wolves – I don't think Philadelphia wants D'Angelo Russell. Yeah. But even on the flip side, like if you're the Timberwolves, I think six months ago, I would have traded D'Lo for Ben Simmons. But watching the way that this thing has played out now and the chemistry and the first unit. And then there's then there's another added layer of, okay, the Timberwolves are tracking to be a play in team, kind of a 500 ish team. But and, and that's fine right now because our bar is so low. It's been 17 years, one playoff appearance. So to, if they if they finish 500 and they and they're in the play in like that's a wild success this year but next year the year after okay as you climb up the ladder where's the glass ceiling for this current unit some of it depends on if ant takes more steps forward right so you're trying to project what is this year's team need but then if eventually you want to set your sights higher would you have to trade Delo or Cat to get to another level, right? And and I, I would assume that all of these discussions are happening. Who can you trade for this year, maybe next year that'll help you? And then long term, who are you building around for like the next five to six years? It is a challenge, undoubtedly. Those are questions that the front office contemplates all the time. It's threading the needle of the present versus the future. Now, Anthony Edwards is twenty years old, right? And Like, he's been making threes at a really good clip. I still think shot selection needs work. Jim Peterson has made the point. He needs to work on cutting a bit more. There's a lot more to Anthony Edwards' game. But remember pre-draft, the Bradley Beal comparison? 
are we starting to see signs that maybe he can be that good? Like, I certainly see Anthony Edwards being an all-star mm-hmm. before his rookie deal is up. Like, if you're this good as a 20-year-old, how good is he at 22, 23? So, like, we had the discussion right after they took Anthony Edwards. Like, what's his floor? What's his ceiling? Ceiling Bradley Beal. Maybe he doesn't quite get there. I'm now it's thinking higher. he can get there. Maybe even it's goes higher. higher. Yeah. yeah. And so it's that it's that delicate balancing act. But that's where you have these expiring contracts to play with. Wendy also told me, I have not heard this myself, but that Josh Okoge has some trade appeal. And certainly the Wolves would be very, very open to moving Josh Okoge. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Dukes, t- tell us about what the decision to hire Marquise Watts as chief experience officer is about and means. Um, because it's I, I have seen a lot of titles in my days covering sports. Chief experience officer is a new one. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's trying to create a better environment. That it's always going to be hard to attract players here to the Twin Cities for obvious reasons. But they, they being Mark Laurie, Alex Rodriguez, the background work they have been doing going back to the summer, they just, they've heard some things, including from some former players, that player relations needs work here. Love it. So Marquise Watts, really good guy, Twin Cities roots. He has a daughter here, but he's been based in LA, but he'll move back here now. Once upon a time was the leader of an AAU program in the Twin Cities, net gain. Rashad Vaughn used to be in that program. Trent Lockett who went to Hopkins High School, went on to have a great career at Arizona State, and he's made a bunch of money overseas. So, like, Marquise Watts has had his fingerprints on the youth basketball scene here in the Twin Cities for a really long time. Transitions to Adidas, then works for Rich Paul, Clutch Sports. So he has a really good relationship with Anthony Edwards. Other Clutch Sports clients, Ben Simmons, Anthony Davis – so he's cultivated a lot of NBA relationships. So he'll bring all that experience now to, to the Wolves. Glenn Taylor was involved in this process. So while Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez to some extent, but certainly Mark and Ethan Casson drove the bus, Glenn Taylor is still involved. Glenn and Marquise met, and I sense that that meeting pushed this across the finish line. But this is a good move. I know it doesn't like grab headlines, but I'm just telling you behind the scenes, if you're a Wolves fan, you should be very excited by this hire. I need to be a fly on the wall for when those guys explain chief experience officer to Glenn Taylor over some <laughs> potato salad and and, Be- uh, and, Becky's. and Becky's cheeseburgers. Yeah. Well, don't forget Becky's lasagna. Yeah, Becky's, Becky's lasagna, lasagna, baby. Well, and this is this is the type of thing I think a lot of people are going to initially roll their eyes at, like a, a chief experience officer. Okay, yeah, just go. You know, that's that's what's going to fix the wolves, right? Like that's going to be, I think, you know, one of the overriding thoughts. But if you start to dig deeper. I love the fact that Mark Laurie and, and Alex Rodriguez, to a certain extent, this feels very Mark Laurie driven, where he's all about solving problems, right? What is, let's simplify everything. What's the problem? How do we solve it? How do we get people in here that can solve the problems? And clearly, like in their six months of digging and discussions, there's some issues behind the scenes with player relations. And, you know, how do you, how do you make this, how do you maximize the success of players and then make this a place that people want to stay and work at and maybe even sign with? And, Listen, it's kind of hokey, chief experience officer. It's a weird title, but I love the thought process here. I love the thought process as well. Plus, there are other organizations, Dallas comes to mind, where they've made comparable moves. So, like, it can't hurt, right? Yeah, he's going to be making pretty good money. But, like, if you're a Wolves fan, like, I don't care if, if you think it's, you know, a bunch of hogwash, fine. But, like... It can only really help. Like, I don't see how a move like this hurts in any way. Yeah. So if it helps build up that relationship even more with Anthony Edwards, and Anthony Edwards isn't turning down a max extension in a couple of years, he'll take that money. But when thinking many years down the road, Anthony Edwards, his decision whether to then sign another contract here, like there's some forward thinking going on that that you need to maintain a, a high level of, you know, relationship status with with Ant specifically, but with others. But 
that Marquise is going to be in charge of that. And I think the thing, too, is un- unlike the Vikings, who, who can hit the reset button here fairly quickly, the Wolves are, you know, the Lions, the Browns. So there's I, there's a lot of work, and, and it, it's going to be small stuff, but there's a lot of work to be done here to change a perception that's terrible, um, which is why, you know, fans aren't going to like this, but a building is part of that too. Like there, there's going to be, well, I think this, fans will like that. Well, the but process may say, not be the taxpayers likeable. won't, but the, yeah. but the point, but the point is changing the perception of this franchise around the league is going to take a lot of work. It's not just uh, Hey, it, it's the new wolves. Ants great. Cat can be great. I get all that, but just the, the franchise as known as Glenn's team, right? That's going to take you're you're going to have to change a lot of people's opinions to get this thing back to to where oh yeah the wolves are a good franchise so it's going to be a step by step thing that will probably take a few years I think well yeah certainly I mean there's always going to be some level of skepticism as long as Glenn yeah. is in charge so frankly the real shift will come you know assuming they can get all their finances in order there's no reason to think they won't so. December of 2023. So 23 months from now, when Mark and Alex become majority owners, that's when we'll see that seismic shift. By the way, the Atlanta Hawks were six games below 500, and that's what we talked about John Collins a few minutes ago. Their fire sale has begun. Just now, Adrian Wojnarowski reporting. Reckless speculation. Cam Reddish, he's one of their rotational forwards, plays you know, 10, 11 points a game, whatever, uh, traded to the Knicks for a protected 2022 first-round pick. And uh, there's also a couple other pieces involved here. But it looks like the Hawks are ready to shake shake things up. So maybe – I don't know, but could you get John Collins without trading one of your three best players? Could you well, get John Collins for draft picks making. and – yeah, well, I mean, you'd have to send out good money. So right. whether that's D'Lo or, okay, Beasley. I mean, you can make it work. Beasley, Prince, Lehman, then multiple first-round picks and or Jada McDaniels. Like, you're not getting John Collins for expiring contracts, Malik Beasley, and one then real asset, whether that's Jada McDaniels or a future first-round pick. It would take multiple good assets yeah. to pry him out of there you got to find uh you got to find like 25 million dollars so and, and the wolves have a bunch of those little like 12 kind of 15 they got a handful of them i don't want to trade beverly though so it would have to be prince or beasley and like a pick or something i don't so, see bev going anywhere phil i no, really don't No, he's the heart like i see him here for the next couple of years i know he's an unrestricted free agent after the year him his side they've been pushing for a contract extension based on the rules the wolves could actually sign him today to a contract extension if they wanted to so it's more the wolves just trying to figure out okay what makes logical sense there are some injury red flags there you know so like how much money are you going to give him there's not many teams with cap space this summer so he's looking at you know the taxpayer mid-level you know so if you're the wolves you know like to me eight nine million a year eight ish million a year but the question is that how much money are you guaranteeing two seasons out like you're guaranteeing the full amount next season but then when looking at the 23 24 season when he's that much older already in his what early 30s 32 33 how much money do you want to be guaranteeing bev at 34 35 years old i think you would have to make that second year a partial guarantee reckless speculation vikings gm search dukes um so in the past what two days day plus now eight names externally have c- come out as people that the vikings want to talk to i think a primary headline from that though is one of those eight names is not will mcclay of the cowboys who we've talked about uh, quite a bit very respected around the league had a chance to go to houston i think it was last year turned that down what can you tell us about will mcclay's absence from that list Judd, I can tell you here on Thursday morning from multiple sources, very much in the mix, that Will McClay is staying in Dallas. Now, my sense is it never got to the point of the Vikings making the request or at least behind the scenes attempting to make a request, but the Vikings are well aware of Will's intentions. I do believe strongly, Judd, that his name came up internally at TCO Performance Center, that when they were concocting 
you know, their lengthy list now have whittled it down to eight that Will McClay was on some sort of initial list. But, yeah, my sense is he will not be the the new Vikings general manager. So, guys, I know publicly facing, the Vikings are painting this as, and the way that they're going about the process, let's request GM interviews first, get those names out publicly through the league. We're going to hire a GM first, and then we're going to turn our attention to coaching. It feels like, just based on some of the rumblings, and you guys tell me because you've been doing more digging on this, that they've been doing some due diligence on coaches. They're not starting from zero on coaches. They're not, they're not, not. right. That's where the Doug Peterson name has come up, Phil. I know you're write it down. Is Doug Peterson as, as the next head coach? Heck, I'll give you a write it down. I'll say Brandon Brown from the Philadelphia Eagles front office is, is the new Vikings general manager. Now interviews won't even Judd, maybe you've heard otherwise, but I hear interviews, this initial wave of interviews, Zoom interviews, by the way, you know, they'll eventually bring a candidate or two to town. But initially, early next week is when the Zoom interviews Mm -hmm. will start to take place. So I don't even think there's going to be one interview today. Maybe one happens tomorrow, but I was told things will ramp up on the interview front early next week. So, like, I'm going all in there with at least a a write-it-down prediction before interviews even take place, but there certainly is a good amount of Brandon Brown steam. So Let's, uh, they certainly have done their due diligence on down. him going back weeks. That's binding. We're going to put that in there, got right, it. Dex? Okay, Dex, I got, got it. it. Doogie, All you're right, going to be you're going to be representing the listeners here because that's already the, in. Okay, that's your bin. Yet, yeah. sure. Now, are, they, are they moving too slow here? No, they're not because this job has has a lot of appeal. In fact, okay. I'll tell you, Phil, that I've texted with three logical candidates. Not all three are on the eight person list okay but three logical candidates all three told me that this job above the bears above the giants is the most appealing that of the three gm openings this is the one they would want the most i don't think it's that close i i really don't i i think when you look at stability um i I know that the bears potentially have a qb i would argue the giants do not but i think when you look at all of the attributes that go along including an ownership group that you know is very patient. Uh, this is a really good job. I also, th- I'll also go back to defending the Vikings here somewhat based on this. If they said we got our list of eight and we are going to have a decision by next Tuesday, we'd all say, hold on a second here. Like this is an incredibly important job and you're going to have a decision by Tuesday. So, so I think it's better not to rush it th- than to satisfy the public's thirst. Right for you know give give me a guy yeah. or gal hire somebody um i would far rather see this play out in a methodical way and and i don't even know that the committee that the vikings are going to use is the right idea so i'm not like applauding oh the committee is going to be great but well I'm just, but i but like I'm the committee idea timing. more than a search firm i i hate the idea of i a do search firm, i so do too I, i'm glad they're not using a search firm i do too dukes the only thing i don't know is i don't know if i love who's on it um, well, okay, so we know we talked about this on Andrew Tuesday. Miller, Andrew Miller, Rob Brzezinski for sure on the committee. Br- Br- Brzezinski's a very smart guy. I mm-hmm. like him. Miller is a baseball guy, and I've heard very mixed things about him behind the scenes, and I don't know if I love th- that one. Um, the the Wilfs are obviously going to be there. I, I think what confuses me, though, is, is both of the uh, co-directors, I believe their titles are player personnel, Jamal Stevenson, Ryan Munnins, are going to be involved in this process, but like one of them, Jamal might be a candidate still. We're not quite sure. I'm just saying I'm not applauding that the committee is the perfect way to do it, but I do think if they rushed the hire, I'd be far more concerned than actually vetting the process, doing your due diligence, and trying to make sure that you have a person in place who's going to be your person for an extended period as opposed to two years from now saying, oh, my God, we screwed that up. So, yeah, I think that's all fair, Judd. By the way, those two names, Jamal Stevenson, Ryan Munnin. So we have this list of eight external candidates. I expect at least one of those to to get an interview. Now, maybe it's a token interview. I would not bet on either getting the job. But I think in the end, the amount of people they end up granting interviews to will be greater than eight. So is it nine? Is it ten? But don't forget about a potential internal candidate or two. Yeah. 
And we'll do uh, later on in this episode of Mackie and Joe, we will do a deeper dive into the eight candidates that we know of, the eight external candidates. But Dukes, give us, uh, before we say goodbye here on this Reckless Speculation Thursday, what else you got? What's in the scoops bag? Well, let me add on Jamal Stevenson that he really likes it here that, okay, let's say they end up hiring Brandon Brown or you name the other candidate that, that will be interviewed. I think Jamal Stevenson ends up staying here. That's that's what I've been hearing, that, that I think Jamal Stevenson remains in, in the Vikings' front office. What else did I write down, Phil? Eric Curry. So he goes down with an ankle injury last night. I checked this morning with a gopher source. Eric will get a checkup later today. There was some level of hope, optimism, as they left the – the Breslin Center locker room last night, that this is not a serious injury, but we'll know more later today. Thankfully, it's not his knee, it's his ankle. But, heck, even with a severe sprain, he could miss a decent amount of time. But there is some hope, some optimism, that there isn't structural damage, there's not ligament damage. Speaking of that, Jalen Noel, doubtful for tonight's game. The Wolves playing the Red Hot Memphis Grizzlies. Memphis on a 10-game winning streak. Remember way back when, when the Wolves beat the Grizzlies by 40-something points? Like, that's one of the great victories of this NBA season because Memphis, all of a sudden, is like a legit top-four team in the Western Conference. The Grizzlies are so good. And the Wolves, what, a month, month and a half ago at Target Center, kicked their ass. And they had, if I recall, almost their full complement of guys. Maybe not their full roster, but... It was darn near their full roster. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but Memphis had a bunch of their guys for that game, and the Wolves just dominated them. But Jalen Noel, no ligament damage, no structural damage, doubtful for tonight, may not play Sunday against the Golden State Warriors when Steph Curry, Clay Thompson come to the Twin Cities, but this is not a long-term injury. Jalen Noel should be back pretty quick, may even be back as soon as heck. If he feels good today, maybe he plays tonight, if not tonight, could play as soon as Sunday. If he doesn't play Sunday, He'll play next week. The Iowa Hawkeyes come to Williams Arena to play the Gophers on Sunday. Keegan Murray is a legit NBA prospect. There will be a number of NBA scouts in the building on Sunday, including the Wolves. The Wolves will have representation Sunday at Williams Arena. We are the home of St. Thomas Athletics, St. Thomas men's basketball, dealing with a little bit of a COVID issue right now. So tonight's game, Saturday's game, North Dakota State, North Dakota, these road games have been postponed. Awesome. Thanks for breaking that news. You and Patrick Gracie, breaking breaking the news. Anything else you guys need to know? Or, or. <laughs> Speculation. Love it, man. All right, that's inside information about your favorite Minnesota Whoa. sports teams, The Scoop with Doogie. You can find that podcast, and you can find Dukes as part of the 5 Eyewitness News sports team. Thanks, Doogie. All right, boys, take it easy. Touch, See ya. All right, all right, yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. Well, you know that. Yeah, for sure. Yep. <laughs> in touch. Speculation. All right, awesome stuff.